It's Tuesday, September 22. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Simone Absalom. Community transmission of the COVID-19 virus continues unabated across the island. Here's the latest update from the Health and Wellness Ministry. As of Tuesday morning, Jamaica's COVID-19 death toll stands at 75. Another five deaths related to the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, were reported on Monday. The latest mortalities are a 61-year-old female with a Kingston and St. Andrew address, a 54-year-old female with a Kingston and St. Andrew address, a 52-year-old female with a St. Catherine address, an 82-year-old male with a Kingston and St. Andrew address, and a 93-year-old male with a St. Mary address. Four of the five deceased had confirmed pre-existing conditions. 127 new positive cases were also reported on Monday. The island's total case number is now 5,270. 67 are males, 60 are females, with ages ranging from 8 to 86 years old. 37 more recoveries were reported on Sunday, pushing that total to 1,444. That leaves us with 3,668 active cases. It also disclosed that there are 16 moderately ill and 10 critically ill patients. A total of 135 persons are now hospitalized, while 11 persons are in quarantine in a government facility, and 23,696 are quarantined at home. At this time, there are 470 imported cases and 263 cases of local transmission while 733 are contacts of confirmed cases. 236 are associated with the St. Catherine Workplace Cluster and 3,568 cases are under investigation. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Melvin Pennant. The Ministry of Health and Wellness will be conducting random sampling of the hand sanitizers being offered to customers entering business places. The development follows instances where customers have reportedly been affected by the sanitizers used by some business outlets. The details in this next report. The bottles used are mostly unlabeled and their handlers are sometimes unsure of the contents that they're spraying. The instructions are usually firm, however. No spray, no entrance. Director of Standards and Regulations at the Health Ministry, Cynthia Lewis Graham, says manufacturers or store owners may be using inappropriate ingredients in their hand sanitizers. At the same time, she has sought to explain that people may have negative reactions to the products depending on the active ingredient. The health ministry recommends either 60 to 70 percent ethanol or 75 percent isopropyl alcohol. In the meantime, the Standards and Regulations Director is encouraging persons with a history of sensitive reaction to some products to carry their own hand sanitizers. Persons who may have had adverse reactions to hand sanitizers are also being encouraged to make official complaints to the Health Ministry's Standards and Regulation Unit. There are almost 200 possible COVID-19 vaccines currently being worked on across the globe. This according to the Director General of the World Health Organization. He was speaking at Monday's press brief from their headquarters in Geneva. Almost 200 vaccines for COVID-19 are currently in clinical and preclinical pre testing. The history of vaccine development tells us that some will fail and some will succeed. The COVAX facility enables governments to spread the risk of vaccine development and ensure their populations can have early access to effective vaccines. Even more importantly, the COVAX facility is the mechanism that will enable a globally coordinated rollout for the greatest possible impact. The COVAX facility will help to bring the pandemic under control, save lives, accelerate the economic recovery, and ensure that the race for vaccines is a collaboration, not a contest. This is not charity. The fastest route to ending the pandemic and accelerating the global economic recovery is to ensure some people are vaccinated in all countries 
not all people in some countries. The WHO's vehicle for vaccine production is the COVAX facility, which is the vaccine's pillar of the access to COVID-19 tools or ACT Accelerator. The ACT Accelerator is a global collaboration to accelerate the development, production and equitable access to COVID-19 tests, treatments and vaccines. However, its long-term efficiency has been threatened by lack of funding. Our aim is to have 2 billion doses of vaccine available by the end of 2021. We're encouraged to see a large number of countries signing up to the COVAX facility. But we face some daunting challenges. For the ACT Accelerator to work as planned, it must be funded. So far, three billion US dollars has been invested. This has resulted in a very successful startup phase, but it's only a tenth of the remaining $35 billion needed for scale-up and impact. $15 billion is needed immediately to maintain momentum and stay on track for our ambitious timelines. Our challenge now is to take the tremendous promise of the ACT Accelerator and COVAX to scale. Next Thursday, October 1, workers in the tourism sector will be able to register for the Tourism Workers Pension Scheme. It's one component of a three-pronged human capital development plan for industry workers, which includes training and capacity building. It will cover all workers in the tourism sector aged 18 to 59, whether permanent, contractual, or self-employed. Benefits will be payable at age 65 years or older to persons who have met the vested period of five years. Minister of Tourism Edmund Bartlett made the announcement while speaking at the recently held Jamaica Hotel and Tourist Association annual general meeting. He also says workers are being prepared for reintegration into the post-COVID tourism sector through online courses. In a bid to tackle deforestation and climate change, all Jamaicans are encouraged to plant trees. To this end, the Forestry Department will be distributing seedlings to members of the public as of tomorrow, Wednesday, September 23, ahead of National Tree Planting Day on October 2. Seedlings can be had from the Forestry Department's nurseries in Kingston, Williamsfield and Manchester, as well as Monegan St. Anne. Individuals who visit the nurseries for free seedlings to plant will be allowed a maximum of 10. For persons or groups that acquire larger amounts, an email must be sent to the forestry department prior to visiting a nursery. Those participating in the community projects can get more by writing to the conservator of forests. The type of seedlings to be distributed can be seen on the forestry department's website at www.forestry.gov.jm. The People's National Party PNP president and leader of the opposition, Dr. Peter Phillips, has announced an interim shadow cabinet until the party elects a new leader. The release lists Dr. Peter Phillips as opposition spokesperson for the planning and development and defense portfolio. Among the appointees are Fitz Jackson, who will take point on national security. Lisa Hanna will shadow foreign affairs and foreign trade. Dr. Angela Brown Burke will take on education and training. Damon Crawford will shadow community development and culture. And Dr. Morris Guy, health and wellness. Take a look at the full list.
National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang has condemned the recent alleged coordinated attacks on police officers and their families. The attacks resulted in the death of 67-year-old Clifton Green, the father of a detective inspector of police who resided in the community of Riversdale, St. Catherine. The minister says that the security forces are undeterred by these attacks and will be redoubling its efforts to dismantle gangs and restore peace and safety in communities. The United Nations is celebrating 75 years of existence this week and its General Assembly's annual general debate is happening today, September 22, in New York. The debates provide member states the opportunity to reaffirm their commitment to multilateralism. It's no surprise that COVID-19 and its attendant issues has dominated the agenda. Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, spoke of the daunting impact the pandemic has had on the world. We face simultaneously an epochal health crisis, the biggest economic calamity and job losses since the Great Depression, and dangerous new threats to human rights. COVID-19 has laid bare the world's fragilities rising inequalities, climate catastrophe, widening social, societal divisions, rampant corruption. The pandemic has exploited these injustices, preyed on the most vulnerable, and wiped away the progress of decades. For the first time in 30 years, poverty is rising. Human development indicators are declining, and we are careening off track in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. As recently reiterated by World Health Organization head Dr. Tedros Gabesias, nothing less than a coordinated global effort can stem the current pandemic. Perhaps no crisis since the Second World War has demonstrated more clearly why we need the UN than the COVID-19 pandemic. We can only confront this common threat with a common approach. WHO is proud to be part of the UN family. At the nations of the world meet virtually for the UN General Assembly this week, WHO has three key messages. First, the pandemic must motivate us to redouble our efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals, not become an excuse for missing them. Second, we must prepare for the next pandemic now. And third, we must move heaven and earth to ensure equitable access to diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. We continue to call on all countries to use every tool at their disposal to suppress transmission and save lives until and after we have a vaccine. Renewed lockdown restrictions in some countries have been having a seesaw effect on global demand for oil. For the latest look on the market and other financial indicators, we join host Gabriel Thompson for the Business Report. In Friday's trading session, the JSE Combined Index declined by 879 points to close at under 400,000 units. Overall, market activity resulted from trading in 76 stocks, of which 32 advanced, 31 declined, and 13 traded firm. The junior market index advanced by 23 points to close at under 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for Barita Investments Limited, Berger Paints Jamaica, and Caribbean Producers Jamaica Limited. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica, Access Financial Services, and Blue Par Group Limited. Trading firm were Siboney Group Limited, Community and Workers of Jamaica Deferred Share, and Dolphin Cove Limited. Trans Jamaican Highway Limited was the volume leader with 3.8 million units, followed by Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares with 1.2 million units, and Pulse Investments Limited with 1.1 million units. Now for the foreign exchange. The US dollar on Friday, September 18, ended trading at $142.57. The Canadian dollar sold for an average $111.29. The pound sterling traded for $185.13. And the euro ended trading at $170.58. 
Oil prices rose on Tuesday as analysts took the view renewed lockdown restrictions would have only a limited impact on fuel demand, partly reversing a steep drop in prices the previous day. Brent crude futures gained 54 cents to $41.98 a barrel. West Texas intermediate crude futures rose 63 cents to $39.94 a barrel. And that's it for the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. In regional news, the distribution of LED bulbs in Trinidad and Tobago, promised by Finance Minister Colm Ilbert in 2019, is to begin on Monday. The distribution will be done by the Trinidad and Tobago Electricity Commission, TN Tech. The 1.6 million bulbs will cost taxpayers $8.8 .8 million, but Public Utilities Minister Marvin Gonzalez believes the cost is a drop in the bucket compared to what the country will save on energy in the next decade. Sunil Lala joined TN Tech's virtual press conference and has filed this report. It was during the 2019 fiscal budget presentation that TNT first heard about government's intention to distribute LED bulbs to households across the country in an effort to reduce the state's energy bill. Almost one year later, the promise will become a reality. From Tuesday, account holders who normally pay their bills at TNT service centers will be able to collect the bulbs. TNT chairman Keith Soju said the delivery process for the 1.6 million bulbs is underway and hopes to have the entire supply at its warehouse by the end of this month. Delivery of the 1.6 million bulbs from our supplier is almost complete, and we expect to have all in our warehouse by the end of September. For Tobago, its full inventory of 100,000 bulbs was assigned from the first batch re received. The project has cost government over $8 million dollars, but Public Utilities Minister Marvin Gonzalez believes this is a small sum to encourage energy efficiency, saying that this country could potentially save millions in the long run. And if fully embraced by the national community, as it must be, our energy conservation and efficiency plan will lead to $1.2 billion in energy cost savings over the next five years and $2.72 billion by 2030. The minister reminded that electricity in Trinidad and Tobago is significantly subsidized and believes citizens need to change their consumption habits. The average account holder enjoys a subsidy of over 80% on their bills as a result of the preferential rate that TNTEC pays for natural gas and the fact that the full production cost is not passed to the consumer. 400,000 households are expected to receive four bulbs each. The bulbs are being supplied by Nova Lighting Trinidad and are manufactured by Emitter Energy Incorporated. And due to COVID-19, people who are using online or electronic means to pay their TNTEC bills can visit the Commission's website to make an appointment to collect their bulbs. TNTEC, though, reminded that the bulbs are free of charge and citizens should not pay anyone to receive any of the government-issued 9-watt LED bulbs. Sonolala, TTT News. At least four of the opposition parties in Barbados are oiling their political machinery and gearing up for a battle ahead of the impending by-election. We have the details in this report. Solutions, Barbados' leader Grenville Phillips III and Ambrose Grovesner of the United Progressive Party have already declared their intention to contest the seat, while the DLP and the PDP say they were not surprised by Sunday's announcement. Opposition leader Bishop Joseph Atherley revealed that two members of his PDP are interested in contesting the soon-to-be-vacant seat. I want to today, obviously. Okay. But there are two gentlemen who uh, are both from St. George North community. Mm. They've been doing some work there. They indicated that they first indicated their interest over a year ago. Okay. So the party covered that. I can tell you as well that uh, the PDP is not the PDP anticipated that there would have been some by election activity in St. George North. Mm -hmm. They've anticipated that for a while now. I can tell you further that the CDP uh, would not be surprised if there is at least one other by election. 
Mm. And in fact, we have not ruled out the possibility of a very early general election. Bishop Avali was also of the view that Clark, who did not receive a ministerial portfolio, was being forced out of Parliament earlier than he intended. They're saying also that we believe that Lane Clark is being forced out of Parliament earlier than he intended. We cannot, we, we cannot say for sure what is the leverage being used against him, and we would not engage in speculation or rumor. But we believe he's being forced out. It seems strikingly strange that a man who has served the constituency for 26 years would just give the constituents a week's notice that he was bringing that representation to an end. In a brief response, a DLP president, Verla de Pisa, also indicated that the developments were no surprise and stressed that the party would be ready. We were predicting a few by elections and observing activity in certain areas, including St. George North. The Democratic Labour Party, therefore, will ready ourselves for the upcoming battle. Meanwhile, Glenn Clark's decision to retire from political office after 26 years of representation appears to have taken very few in the constituency by surprise. And constituents, particularly from his community of Newberry and surrounding areas, have hailed the BLP MP for his remarkable service. However, on the streets, it has been equally rampant with speculation about who his replacement will be. In St. Lucia, the executive director of the National Council of and for Older Persons is urging young St. Lucians to exercise solidarity and step up action to effectively prevent and protect their elder persons from physical and psychological abuse. Cecile Actiel reports. An elderly man in Babuno was viciously beaten by a group of angry residents in the community. The incident was recorded on video, sparking a firestorm on social media and prompting the National Council of and for Older Persons to decry the abuse of the defenseless man. In the shocking footage, the man is shown being battered by several people, some of them mouthing expletives at him. Another video uploaded and shared, uniformed law enforcement officers stood on the scene. The beating was posted on social media on Thursday, September 17th. According to Sinusha Police, the incident occurred on Friday, September 11th. The National Council of and for Older Persons Executive Director, Helen Charles, said there is no regard or pity for senior citizens. She said that the organization is inundated with reports of elder abuse. We report that to the police, and sometimes it takes so long for for you know for it to take action and for something to be done when it comes you know the, to to redress and, and and to make sure that the elder will have been taken care. Of. Sometimes you find their own family to abuse them. But my appeal to those persons that are doing that is to consider these elderly persons. NBC Prime obtained information from two residents in the area who told us that the elderly man had moments before the incident burglarized a home in Bogis, Babuno. Some of um, our elderly folks right now, because of what is happening in the world now, our elderly have been abusing whatever we in all ways, mentally, physically, even depriving them of the basic need, food and so on. But what we are trying to do as our organization is to reach out to persons and see how best we can treat the enemy because they are the foundation of, of our country. The National Council of and for Older Persons is keen to break the taboo on elder abuse and to prevent and tackle it where possible, mainly by raising awareness of the problem. I will try to reach out to Tedrusha to educate them on how to do things and how to treat their own parents. Because don't forget your parents are the ones who, who bring you up, eh? whether it's the person is your mother or your father. But sometimes you have to look 
within yourself and say, I will not do these things because it, it can be my murder, my father. If somebody do that to my murder, my father, how would I do? What action that I would take? According to estimates by the UN World Health Organization, WHO, one in six people aged over 60 suffers from abuse. That means nearly 141 million people globally. This number might be much higher as elder abuse is one of the most hidden and underreported violations. October will be observed as International Day of the Elderly. Cecil Actil, NBC Prime. In sports, the trial of Jamaica National Junior shot put record holder Kevin Nedrick is expected to start today, September 22. He will appear in the Hennepin County Court in Minnesota where he faces a charge of third degree criminal sexual conduct. Nedrick is out on a U.S. $1,000 bail after his arrest just under a month ago. The 21-year-old University of Minnesota shot putter, who was about to start his senior season, was arrested and charged in August after allegations that he allegedly overpowered a woman and assaulted her, according to reports. Federal and state laws that govern private student information prevent the university from sharing further details at this time. Nedrick represented Jamaica in both the shot put and discus at the World Under-20 Championships in Poland in 2016 and cop silver at the Carifta Games that same year. He would go on to win silver and bronze at the Pan Am Juniors in 2017 in Peru. In other sporting news, reports emerged on Monday that a consulting firm hired by Tokyo's Olympic Bid Committee paid some 370,000 U.S. dollars to the son of an International Olympic Committee member before and after Japan was picked to host the Games. The claims come even as French authorities probe an alleged vote-buying scandal surrounding two million U.S. dollars paid by the Tokyo Bid Committee to Black Tidings, a single based firm linked to Singalese national Papa Masata Diak. He is the son of Lamine Diak, the former head of the International Association of Athletic Federations, now renamed World Athletics, who is also a member of the IOC. At the time of the Tokyo bid back in September 2013, Diak was said to have held influence over votes from the African bloc of nations. According to Japan's Kyoto News, the now defunct Black Tidings has transferred more than 150,000 US dollars to the personal account of Papa Masata Diak and wired 217,000 US dollars to a company run by him in January 2014. In an interview with Kyoto, Papa denied the allegations, saying the money he received was related to a, quote, sponsorship deal made in China. There's nothing to do with Tokyo Olympics, end quote. In the meantime, former head of the Tokyo Bid Committee has also denied any wrongdoing. And that's the news on behalf of the news and production team. Thanks so much for watching PBCJ. Remember, we are the People's Station. Stay safe.